on I'd like to call to order the March 2021 web meeting. Um, and I'd like to start off with asking if anybody had any, uh, I'd like to confirm the minutes from the February meeting. Did anybody have any comments on the February notes? I'm gonna uh, make a motion to approve the February minutes. Anybody care to second that? He second. seconded it, but he was on mute. He did it by hand, so it's been seconded. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 And or raise your hands, aye. Any nays? Aye. aye. Okay, the uh, February minutes are approved. Garrett, is, is uh, I'm sorry, is Rush taking minutes now from now on? Just Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yes, I am, that's correct. Yeah. I'm taking minutes now. Yep. Thank you. Yep, Thanks, Rush man. is doing minutes, thank you. Uh, yeah, you're right, I skipped, I skipped ahead, sorry. Introductions, uh, let's go ahead and do uh, city staff introductions approximately alphabetical, followed by web introductions. Um, Claire Fogel song. That would be Mike. Sorry, technical difficulty there. Uh, Mike Broskin, City of Bellingham staff. <clears throat> Rush Duncan, City of Bellingham staff. Uh, Alan Richardson, WAB member. Gabe Lloyd, WAB member. John Pepper, WAB member. Garrett Leckwee, WAB chair. Or a white WAB member. Ernest Sherb. Um, not clear. My uh, WAB uh, my WAB term expired on February 22nd. So maybe I'm a private citizen at this point. Mm. You know, I looked I looked that up, Ernie, and it and it doesn't expire till later in the year, but I could have sure, you told it, it did expire earlier, but I think you're good. Well, it's been listed on the website as February 22nd this it year. It still is. It is now? I believe so. Well, I looked once and it was a lot later. <laughs> so I don't know. Okay, well, I'll assume I'm a lab member. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Well, I had the letter all ready to go, so. Because you, you, had, you had also sent me an email that said, did I want to continue being a lab member? And I said, yes. And yeah, I, I, I yep, never heard from that. you after that. And I have and I have the letter ready to go. And then I looked again and it appeared as if you were still a member in good standing through like June or something. So I'll look again. I'll figure it out. OK, well, I don't know about good standing. There's a, a whole personality component to that. And, like there's a test you got to take. And anyway. <laughs> and I'm Olin Anderson, WAB member. I think I'm the last one. And I only have another this might be my last meeting officially before I have to get renewed. Hey, assuming you want to get renewed, I'll put that request in also. I'm thinking about it, not sure right now. Oh, okay. Let's see, is there any, I believe that's all the introductions. Let me know if I missed you. Uh, let's go on to public comment. Do we have, uh, have anybody from the public on tonight? Does not appear to be anyone from the public on tonight. Sounds good. Uh, I might for a second, Ernie. Your term shows 224 of 22 currently on our website. Yeah, I, I just looked that up. You're correct. So I'm a lab member. Good. All cool. right. Thank you. Let's Back make no mistake about that. Feel, feel free to speak freely then. <laughs> um, it, one, one thing I wanted to do tonight was uh, just kind of for kicks, a little reflection moment is on the agenda. It is a moment to think for 60 seconds about why it is you're on the web, what, you know, what it is you appreciate, or um, if you're city staff, like why it is you appreciate doing this work, hopefully you appreciate it. Um, <laughs> uh, just that sort of thing. Just a, a little reflection, we'll go around the table real quick. Um, you know, for myself, I was uh, born and raised in Bellingham, 
I think that drinking water quality is important and I appreciate that the city um, is taking a spearheading role on, you know, water quality uh, and has and has worked, if I understand correctly, has worked with other agencies to kind of get everybody on board to, you know, make sure that the water quality in the watershed is protected. And I, I appreciate the city staff doing that. And I, that's why I keep doing this myself personally. I'm now going to look for a raise of hands for anyone who's prepared to speak. Anybody want to say their, yep, uh, Alan, go ahead. Sure. Well, I've lived in the watershed for 49 years and um, still c care about the watershed and quality of the water and proper care of the Lake Whatcom and its watershed. And certainly the care for native plants and their habitats and protecting those, which helps protect the watershed. Yeah, and I pre I I, for one, have not been in the watershed as long as you, nor have I been on the web as long, but I appreciate that sentiment and your hard work. Somebody else raise your hand, staff or web. Abe, Abe, go ahead, Abe. Uh, back around 2011, I was living in Victoria, having just finished my master's degree and made a conscious decision that I wanted to grow some roots or yeah, be a rooted person. I'd worked a lot with indigenous peoples and, and valued how um, rooted they were in place. And so I decided to move back to Bellingham where I grew up. And, um, and I thought that being engaged in um, some kind of uh, group like this would be an important way to be connected to the community and I care a lot about environmental issues and especially natural resource management issues um, and so and having grown up in the watershed I and, and now living in the watershed I thought this was a good bit so that's why I'm part of the group and I enjoy enjoy it a lot. Well I appreciate your hard work and the fact that we're all here tonight. Uh, anybody else care to dare raise their hand? Sydney staff included. Uh, Laura, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I mean, it, I think it, it's probably obvious to say that I care about the watershed and I care about drinking water um, quality. I think there are a growing number of places on the planet where people don't have clean drinking water. And I think a lot of us take it for granted. Um, and there's a lot of work that goes into making sure it's clean and that it stays clean going forward and that with climate change and increased population that's going to get harder and harder and so that's something that i think about a lot and one of the reasons that i'm involved in the web and i appreciate everybody else who's here because they care also about making sure we keep our watershed health, healthy and clean want well, to appreciate your hard work as well uh, anybody else care to chime in? Uh, this is John. Um, I like the topic. Uh, I spend a lot of time out uh, in the environment uh, pretty much every day. And I was hoping to find a way to perhaps give back. I am open whether or not my skill set is the best match, but it depends on what we decide to do, how you know, strategic we become, if we get into scorecards, how we want to mature this group um, and, and manage this going forward. So I'm interested, I'm learning a lot. Um, I enjoy it, but I also have to be open that depending on what this group wants to achieve, we need to have a board that brings those skill sets and whether we need more scientists, whether we need a lawyer, whether we need a financial person. Yeah, I, I don't have the answers to those. I'm open to it. But at this point, it seems like we're kind of trying to figure it out. So um, yeah, I, I enjoy it and um, hopefully I'll make a difference. I appreciate that. Uh, Can you are we electronic hand raising or physical hand raising? <laughs> We're, um, I'm going physical at this point. I saw Olin raise his hand. Uh, sorry. Uh, so uh, actually, I'm here to 
help make sure that Michael Perkelson has tons of stuff to do. And <laughs> want to get more land for him to restore. And uh, I'm glad that uh, the city has made the commitment to land preservation around this watershed. So that's why I came and that's what's kept me here. If uh, someone raised their hand electronically, I'm sorry. Mike, go ahead. <laughs> uh, both. Um, yeah, I guess what attracts me to this work in this position um, is kind of two things. I definitely have a deep interest in public land and public land management and places that everyone can go and visit and benefit from, um, just because I really like the equity that that delivers to a community. Um, so I guess, you know, restoring these properties and seeking them out and acquiring them for our community just sort of serves two purposes. To me, there's sort of that public land and um, preservation of, you know, natural systems that are important to, for, you know, ecology and habitat, but also just kind of that dual purpose of also providing um, a service to the people who may not even visit those properties, but that they're just getting a, a benefit from us having them out there. You know, the other probably 100,000 people who pay for this program, um, just to know that they're benefiting from enhanced water quality and resilience to our water quality through this program, I think makes it pretty special. Just kind of having that dual purpose of public land and um, clean and safe drinking water. So, Yeah, and I want to definitely give a shout out to, to Mike uh, being the person on the ground talking to the public like it's easy for me to sit here behind my computer and talk about how great the watershed is, but like Mike, you know, interfaces with the people and patrols the property, uh, you know, properties to, you know, keep us informed. And we, I, I think I speak for us all when we say we really, really appreciate that uh, hard work uh, that involves, yeah, talking to folks and, and really literally getting on the ground in the watershed. <laughs> well, thanks. I always tell Claire he doesn't actually have to pay me, but <laughs> don't say that don't say that what what was that what what did you say nothing i think he was saying he was applying to geoengineers and said the city didn't pay enough and he was going to come work for us so uh any, anybody else anybody else we still have three more minutes i will um i'm completely dedicated to the acquisition program i think it's the single best thing that we're doing for the watershed and i've enjoyed working with the different configurations of the web over the years um, it's, it, um, intrigues me and, uh, and, um, oh, I don't want to get too dramatic, but, um, shed a tear. I'm, I'm, hug I'm, it honored, out. I'm honored to work with citizens that are really committed to, um, the community and to water quality in this case. And it's, it's, I've been impressed. I've been doing this for, um, I don't know, maybe too long, but uh, 18 years or something. And, it, and, and I'm astounded that this group has always been consistent. It always hasn't been the same people, but had they, the people that are on the web show up and they're concerned and it's, um, it's good to work with them, with you. Now we appreciate your hard work and I'd, I'd like, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this is not against the rules to uh, cut out, to add Rush to the conversation, Rush must feel somewhat involved. Rush, you got to feel somewhat invested. I I mean, I'm delighted to be working for natural resources. I work for Claire and Mike and Renee and Eric Johnson and Iris and a lot of people. Um, I'm just happy to be here <laughs> for sure. Um, that's all I can say is that I'm happy to be a part of this. I'm happy to be in Bellingham. I've been here 15 years um, or so, maybe a little longer than I actually. So I'm from Texas originally. So I'm from another planet. 
Um, and this place continues to surprise me and delight me. And I just feel really, really lucky. I will tell you, it's been a very intense week for the city. And it makes, it really does mean a lot to be part of something where we're trying to make this a better place. So, but I'm just happy to be here. Thank you. Oh. I, uh, missed um, anyone? Garrett, I don't know if you're, is your, can you, is your camera on Garrett? Do you know it that? Is, uh, it's off because it's off right. for a reason. I normally like to be okay. um, on, but it's off. Sorry. It's normally when I, it's long story. Anyway, it's off. <laughs> uh, so I thought that uh, to uh, Ernie wanted to say something. Sorry. Ernie was missed, missed his turn. Uh, I missed Ernie. Go ahead, Ernie. Uh, I'm on the lab simply because I, I think it's important that uh, citizens participate in their government. There were several different advisory boards to be on and other commissions, and I felt I had the time. It's important I become part of it. Uh, the subject matter is, is, uh, is of concern because it's drinking water, but it, it also is, uh, is a mix of, of, uh, of uh, politics, policy, and, and science, and I enjoy all of those. Yeah, um, we appreciate your, uh, your input and we appreciate everybody's you know, hard work on this, uh, on this board. Um, so for tonight, sorry, just pulling up for tonight, pulling up the uh, document. Hey, Garrett, so I, Garrett, could I say one more thing? Cause yeah. you, you go, you, you go faster than I can hit my mute button sometimes. And I, I wanted to make a comment about the, uh, the notes. What I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking since we're no longer recording these meetings, they are our, being recorded. We're recording are, they, them. are they archived? Are they continue going to continue to be archived so you can refer back to the actual uh, recording? Yep, they are on the website, and they are yeah. All of the meetings have been recorded since I've been involved, so okay. they are available. So, so there's no plan to remove recordings moving forward. Not until we are done with the COVID, is my understanding. Until once we start meeting again in person, then. That will be, this is my understanding, and Claire, y'all can tell me if you know, understand differently, but basically we're recording these meetings because of the COVID. Once we're back in person in a physical meeting space, originally the meetings were recorded for our audio for the notes. Right. So we'll kind of like approach it at that point, whether or not we record going forward once we're kind of meeting back in person. It's a conversation that the entire city is having right now because like the city council and everybody. Um, so I, right now we're recording all the meetings and I'm taking the notes. With the notes, I also feel like, you know, I'm not a scientist. So if y'all have deeper notes or personal notes that you want to take, please feel free to do them. I'm kind of looking at like action items and like an overview. So, I mean, I can take verbatim notes, but I'm not sure that would be useful either. So, but. Oh, this is Garrett. I'll speak to that topic with my opinion, which is like uh, verbatim notes, no, <laughs> in my opinion. Uh, but, you know, just enough detail to say like, this was discussed, this was brought up, this was, you know, but uh, there have been some note takers who have said like, this person said literally this, that person's person said literally that. And like, I don't know, that's a little overkill in my, in my opinion, others can chime in, but my, my opinion is just, you know, enough detail to know what was discussed and kind of action items and that sort of thing. Others, the recording, others, others the can feel free to chime in. <laughs> the recording will also, it has a transcript. Um, if you click on the link and I'll make sure I will resend everybody here, the, the links to all the recordings. Cause I have them. I can send you one email with the links of all the recordings we've got. And there, the machine will do a running transcript of who said, like under your login names and what they said, but it's not great. But you can listen to it and read it and you can, you know, it, it works. It's actually searchable too. You can scroll down and like pick a conversation. And it'll jump to that part in the recording. So it's magic. Well, I, thank you. I, I think it's important to, I, I actually like the idea of having recordings. Uh, audio recordings are fine. 
as long as that continues. Because, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking, um, at least it's been my experience, that what gets written down, if that's the sole source of the, of the archived material, can, can uh, provide a different flavor to the reader as time passes. And one of the things I noticed in, in uh, last month's notes is, uh, uh, you know, one, five years from now, somebody could read this and, and get a whole different flavor than what really occurred there. And, and, and the lines are concerned how WAB is treating city staff and what is being asked of them, request to work more in synergy, uh, and, and a number of, of items like that are micromanaging the web, I think was one of the other comments. And I think out of context, you read that, you go, well, who said that? So those you know, were, or, those were verbatim quotes. I, I know, but who said that? It's, it's, well, that's, it's, it's distinctly yeah. different if someone in the web said that, said, uh, there was someone in the web. Yeah. That, those or, were, or, or city staff was saying that sure. they're two different things. Well, so, yeah, I mean, this is, a again, this is a conversation for y'all, not me. Y'all let me know what you want here with, as far as this is concerned. I mean, so the way, like, I would take notes, those are verbatim quotes. I'm not keeping track of who is saying what. I get your point, Ernest, absolutely. Um, but again, th what you're talking about is a transcript and not really notes. If it's like a back and forth discussion, um, I mean, if there are other people who feel like they take better notes i mean i'm i just don't you know i'm not sure i can follow the conversation sometimes it's so high level to capture exact i mean it everyone will have a different idea of what kind of notes they want but again there's a there's a recording and there's a transcript that's going right through there so with the link to the recording if you were Five fifty years from now, you were like, what is that? Presumably, if the internet's still up, you could click on the recording, find that section, and I could go back and tell you right now. I can look at it in this meeting, and I can go back and I'll tell you who said that and find what minute they said it in the recording. Well, I, I, don't, so, get, don't get me wrong. I'm not being critical of your oh, I, I, I totally I, get your point, but I, I, I was just... just want to, I just wanted to find out you if know. we're going to continue recording it recording these these meetings even if it's an audio recording because frankly i think the the it, it's great to have notes and 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 have them as a as a summary a synopsis of what occurred but the actual recordings can can be important can be important whether they are or not is probably low prob it's i'm sure that's a low probability you'll go back to them but i, I think it's important to have detailed uh, a recording which in effect is the is uh is what was actually said. Yeah, it, it sounds like the recordings will continue. I appreciate Russia's notes. I, you know, again, I'll just reiterate, I don't think that anybody, city, WAB, whatever, should take like word for word notes, especially if there's recordings. And, you know, I, I, I think, uh, and as Rush said, anybody else is welcome to take their own notes. And and uh, the, let me think about this, the, the, the minutes or the you know the the notes go out and so if somebody has comment uh you know they want something changed we can we can change that too but it, it sounds like for the foreseeable future there'll there will be recordings uh claire do you is there any do you have any indication that recordings will will be discontinued is there any talk within the city about that um no, actually, um, no, not that I know of. Okay. And actually, I thought um, IT was having a hard time with all the with everything getting recorded. So I'm, um, so I, I think it's good that we're still getting recorded. Um, but I, I, you know, last month I guess it was I was under the impression that IT was having a hard time catching up with everything. So that is true. Well, it does triple the Freedom of Information Act request archiving part of. Yeah the equation yeah i can imagine that that's i wholeheartedly agree that i mean if it were me i would get away from recordings and get to just you know notes and people can comment if they want to change or add to the notes or have you, but that's just my two cents well the, the um, problem the problem garrett is is it's very difficult to to actually participate 100 in these meetings and take notes sure 
very That's difficult to do that. So I think it's fantastic that someone in the city is taking the notes, but the only way, and, and, and you know, if I'm, if I'm participating, I can speak only for myself. If I'm participating in the meeting, I'm trying to pay attention to what people are saying and writing down my own notes other than jotting something down to, to, that I can recall if I wanna talk about something during the meeting is one thing but to, to, to write detailed notes and then compare them to what, to what the other note taker had is like an impossible task. That's why I feel that recording, if you had to do that, you can go back to that recording. Sure, yeah. And, that's, and that's, that's, like that's my only point. I mean, I, I, I think note taking during this meeting is very difficult to do. I, 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 I uh, after doing that one time myself, I, I, I commend anybody that can pay attention and write detailed notes. Well, if I recall correctly, your notes were very good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I missed that on the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate Rush taking notes for now, and it sounds like there will be recordings for the foreseeable future. So we'll, we'll go with that. Uh, on the agenda tonight, we had, uh, there's the property acquisition document that the city produced. Thank you for producing that. I think that's great. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, there's the 2020 progress report. I thought like that's good to just you know discuss briefly. Uh, a couple of committee re committee reports and then um, the executive session. And I think Claire said the city doesn't have too much to report, but I did want to save some time just to chat about whatever you know properties. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to go to discussing the. Um, property acquisition document. And I apologize, I'm going to go off screen again because I can't see my notes until I close my computer. Stand by. Yeah, so last meeting, uh, the city uh, produced the um, factors contributing to initial decision to to pursue acquisition of property. And this was super helpful. Thank you, Claire. Uh, I had a couple, uh, I guess, questions, comments on this. Um, let's see, availability, willingness. Uh, I might try to share my screen. Can I do that? Let me try to share screen. Share. Uh, by chance, can anyone see this? Looks good. So, so uh, the city produced this, and you know, any, anybody feel free to jump in. But I was super thankful for this because I feel like prior to this, there was the where's the model in here? The the, the scores, yeah, scores from modeling and ranking. I feel like this piece, you know, I understood this piece. I guess what I you know, which is part C. I didn't understand A, B, <laughs> D, and all these other parts. So just wanted to throw it out to the group to discuss anything. I mean, just to for starters, um, I had one question for the city under availability. It says, has the owner contacted the city? Can I assume that this isn't like an all or nothing starter, non-starter? Like we don't, the, the city doesn't, only consider properties whereby the owner has contact the, contacted the city. Is that, can I? Yes, that? correct. That's, yeah, that's okay. correct. There's right. nothing on here that's, a, there's nothing on here that's a poison pill. Right, okay. So just, but that's a consideration. Obviously if the owner has contact, contact, contacted the city, that's a big deal. But if they have not, you know, we're still, you know, looking at it. Um, I understand the history piece. Um, uh, for my part, I don't know if this is, you know, feasible or technically achievable, but for my part, I guess I would ask, like, is there sort of a rolling uh, spreadsheet or database uh, that tracks all of the history? In other words, or is it sort of in, in people's heads? Like, I guess my question what is exactly? like, what's that? History of what exactly? Like well, from like let let's say that like today, a property owner puts their property up for sale, and you know they may ping, maybe they ping the city, maybe they don't, and then they 
it, it sits there and then like Claire talks to him or my, uh, Matt Gossett or somebody talks to the property owner and they have a chat. And then the property owner after several months takes it off the market and or you know just whatever, whatever the history may be. Maybe the city does or does not buy it or there's some problem with it. And then like three years goes by Matt moves to Boston and we get a new real estate agent and the city or the property, the, the same property owner comes back on the market and says, Hey city, remember I pinged you a couple of years ago. I, I, I'm just wondering like, yeah, uh, I can, I can speak yeah, to does, that. Does, does every interaction get tracked by the city? Yeah. Each like potential property. Once we began any sort of the process sort of gets like an ID and gets kind of cataloged in our, in our file structure. And that's, that's Matt Gossett's. He keeps that organized in ads or whatever to that, but it is all cataloged and, you know, those point, like the points of contact or whatever, any sort of communications or, you know, especially of course, if there's a model score or an appraisal or any of that stuff that all gets saved and um, whether or not we purchase the property. Okay, that's like tremendous. I love um, it's it's on the staff side though for sure. I mean, sure, yeah, no, and and it's not necessarily like the lab is privy to all that, but we just wanted to. We're I think that was one of the questions is like, you know, uh, is that being tracked in paper somewhere, not just in someone's recollection? <laughs> the, the only yeah. the only situation where there may not be a tracking number assigned is if a property owner called up and said, "I've got five acres. I want three million dollars for it." And we just purchased something in that area, five acres for two hundred fifty thousand. That's probably the end of that conversation. Right. Hey, Garrett. Yeah, Laura. Sorry, I'm off camera because my internet's being wonky. Um, so, can I thank you for that information? You might be cutting out some. Am I cutting out? Yeah, and 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 as always, you're calling from a tin can in Egypt. Yeah. So lean, yeah. lean, lean forward to your computer and yell really loud. I only seem to have. Can you hear me now? A little bit. Yep. All right. I guess I could try and write this out, but my question is, if is about in the past, if we wanted to know, um, for example, how many properties in the last five years has the city not purchased because they couldn't come to an agreement on price, for example. Do we have that data? Could we get that information? That is kind of the follow-up question that I had about that. Yeah, I would agree. Is that like is that like uh, quarryable? I don't know if people are familiar with quarries, but you could have like a, you know, a table that shows like the reason something was lost, and it could just have a one or a zero or whatever. Is that? I, I would agree with Laura. Is that? Is that uh, you know, easily attainable to get that statistic? I don't know. The, the, the information is kept in separate files. So querying would be, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's been consistency in uh, the depiction of, or the, uh, yeah, the depiction of the, um, how the process has been unsuccessful. I'd have to check on that um, to see if it is um, manageable. It, it, it just, I'll just straight up ask Claire, in your opinion, is that a waste of time to do that? I mean, do you, for example, do you know off the top of your head, I think you've told us this before, do you know off the top of your head, you know, if a property has not been acquired, is it, you know, 99.5% of the time the case that it had to do with price? Because like, if you knew that off the top of your head, there's no reason to keep a detailed database, you know, if you already know that, you know? I disagree with that, sorry. Go ahead, Claire. I'm sorry. Well, you disagree with me before I say. No. <laughs> I disagree, she disagrees with me. I disagree when, with. Huh. I hope will not happen. Whoops. Are you there? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. It was. I was just disagreeing with Garrett that there's a lot of good information in your head, Claire, but um, you won't be here forever. And so, how do we get that information to other people? going forward, all of that, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and I think we could probably track it down through the files. Um, 
I do, you know, I, I have a, I have an idea of the properties that, um, that we haven't purchased because of a disagreement with the landowner for some either price, mostly, I, I can't think of anything else other than price, but um, timing is never, we've always worked out the timing issues, um, much to our um, non-benefit at times, uh, but um, the only other, the only other case is uh, the, the one or two uh, situations where the council rejected the uh, proposal, um, and and I think I've I think I've um, spoke to that in uh, in the past, and gave and uh, provided the reasons for uh, for that and and the fact that we've actually changed our policies a bit since then. So um, it's not really complicated. Uh, it's um, I I could go back through, but um, there's. For now, if you're satisfied with the fact that it's price, that's probably what the what the uh, product of any research would end up with. Also, it seems like there's also got to be a, a fair number of parcels that rank too low, or that it's just price per developable unit that is an issue. Not um, not finding an agreement on um, price relative to the Excess uh, assessment value. Well, if it ranks really low, there's a, a chance we're not going to pursue it, so there wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be a rejection of during the through the process. Okay, yeah, different category, but those those um, results also seem like they'd be um, important to track over time because potentially, if we're sitting on a whole bunch of money that isn't getting spent, um, maybe we need to change our um, our threshold so that we. Are still capturing. Um, we're still expanding the program uh, because we have the budget to do so, or something like that. Do you, do you see where I'm headed? I hear what you're saying. I I think um, the philosophical question there is: Do you want to spend the public's money on project on properties that may not um, be high valued for the reasons that are that are scored the, for the metrics that are scored in the model. Um, you know, if it, come out, if it came out with 150 score and it was priced right, is that still, is that what we want to spend our money? Is that, does it make sense to, some, to purchase something that has little merit for the purposes of the pro program? I think that's a worthwhile conversation. And, and I think, can you guys hear me? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm with you. And I think it's also a, a still goes back to the question of like, how are we tracking these convert these um, uh, the decision points over time? And I that's kind of the part of that that I, I think is the most interesting as it relates to this conversation and how we can do it going forward. Um, and also, um, there was the issue. I mean, we've talked about this a little bit about price uh, assessed value, and that the city doesn't pay more than assessed value. And if it's a, you know, two hundred and fifty thousand assessed value, and the buyer wants three million, then yeah, that's obvious that that's not going to happen. But what if the buyer wants two seventy five? So those. Lord, you mean appraised versus? If it, did I say? Yeah, if we, if we, if it's. If there's a reasonable, you know, 250 or 275, that's a reasonable difference uh -huh. to then pursue uh, and get a, an appraisal and see if we can't get agreement on that appraisal. And even if at some point, at some times, the, okay. the seller will bring an appraisal to the city and then we'll do our own appraisal and compare appraisals um, because oftentimes, yeah. well, appraisals are often um, conditioned differently. Yep. Okay, thank you. I, I think for, uh, for, for, for me, I, this, the city did a fantastic job putting together this objective ranking system for land, uh, for land acquisition. But, but then there are certain properties where they rank higher on the, the objective criteria, yet those properties 
weren't pursued or weren't purchased and ones of lower rank, according to the objective criteria, were, were purchased. And so I think what, the, what, what brought this particular document about is, is there are some subjective judgments being made that are outside of that ranking system, which is fine. But the piece that for me that's missing is how the subjective uh, criteria were applied such that it reduces the value of the objective ranking and a lower objective ranking property is purchased. And I think without a uh, without collecting that data as to how that 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 uh, that property that was say ranked lower, how that managed to get purchased, it's difficult. It's difficult to really understand how this sub subjective criteria works in practice. At least, well, at least for me, I, I like if you there's only there's probably not a lot of properties that that you purchase that the 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 objective ranking is 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 lower than than or excuse me is lower than than other properties that you didn't pursue. So collecting the data would only be collecting to me at least would only be collecting data on properties that that uh, had lower rankings than others in the, in, the, in the objective criteria and you decided to purchase the lower ranking properties because you apply the subjective criteria. I, I, do you understand I, what I'm saying, Claire? I understand. And I'm wondering, is this philosophical or do you have a, an example? Because I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, I don't have the list in front of me and I don't know that we've ever come to a pass where at the same at, at one at, at the same moment, we had a, uh, a, a decision to be made between a, a high ranking and a less high ranking property. That could be. I, I don't recall that happening. But if it's philosophical, I think to answer your question, there may be some there may be some circumstances that um, with a high ranking property that it's just not available for some reason. Uh, we've got a high ranking property now that we were pursuing and just isn't, it became unavailable. Um, and so if, if we're looking at our effort, you can see that we put effort into that. It's not gonna come to pass at this, at this point. And there may be a lower ranking property that we are able to purchase. And so it might look like on paper that we went for a lower ranking property for some reason. But the case is we usually we're usually pretty consistent with um, with using the ranking and the model and the ranking as a as a real touchstone. The other criteria, well, some of them are you know pretty obvious. If it's not available, then you know that's I just put that down there because it makes you know I just to be completely transparent here. If it has a history that doesn't that doesn't show up in the model, that's another factor. The the history might be that the homeowner didn't want us didn't wasn't able to or didn't want to negotiate the price. Um, funding availability, not, you know, we just consider that it's not, like I said, there aren't any poison pills in this subjective, in this subjective list. Um, I, I wasn't speaking philosophically. I, I think all this came about, at least in my mind, was um, I, I, I think back in November, maybe October, where Laura had mentioned a property on, um, off of North Shore, I can't remember the name of the street. It's the one that Alice lives on. There was five acres out there. Um, it was, it, it, I believe Olson Creek flowed through it or was adjacent yep. to the property. Yep. And, and, and yet that property had a higher objective rank and yet it wasn't pursued and other properties of a lower objective rank were purchased. And that, I think that's what started this whole conversation as to how does this work? Because we had subsequent in executive session, we had a subsequent conversation, you know, where, where we talked, we actually talked about that. Why are these properties being purchased? And then, then uh, you know, you and your team came up with the subjective factors that, that modify the, the data, the, the, the ranking data that you put together. So it's it's not it's not philosophical. I, for for me, it's it's just trying to understand how the subjective factors are applied. Because if if you 
it would be a it would be a very simple matter if if the objective rankings always work there would be no need for subjective rankings so the subjective rankings are there for a reason because everything can't be captured i assume it, uh, uh, in the objective rankings and so you 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 created the subjective rankings to determine you know to modify what 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 the objective rankings are so there's it's obvious that the objective rankings don't work 100% of the time they, they aren't the only thing we consider. I'm trying to keep this philosophical because that property you mentioned is still in play. We just haven't got, we just, Matt's been pretty busy and hasn't, um, we haven't fully explored that. But to keep it philosophical, um, we don't wanna make this a checklist. We don't wanna make the subjective criteria a checklist. It's just things that go through our head and it's everything that I could think of over the years that we've looked at in addition to the, uh, the model. And like I said, when I was introducing this, this subjective list isn't applied or isn't in play every time we have a property. We don't go, we don't go down through this as a checklist. It's just that in the course of conversations we've had over the years, these are the issues that have, uh, that have caused us to take a step back, take a look at the property and see if we wanted to uh, pursue it given um, what could have been a, um, a less than desirable purchase. Well, um, let me suggest that the WAB between meetings continue to kick this around, think about it and offer, I guess, ask questions and or offer, I don't know, suggestions. Uh, we're, we're well behind schedule, sorry. But uh, but uh, I, think for, I think for a good reason, uh, it's been a good discussion and I heard somebody chime in. Yeah, can I add one thing to that? Yeah. Um, I guess ditto sort of what every, everything Claire said, you know, there's a queue and it's a process obviously, as you all know, but I am just looking at our, the spreadsheet of like current prospects um, and where they're, you know, at different phases and everything that's kind of moved forward you know, technically has a higher, you know, actually has a higher score than that property you mentioned. Anything that's higher on the list and moving forward is actually further along. So everything currently, you know, even since November, you know, is actually really operated on the scores. So I'm sort of curious, Ernie, what you're referring to that we moved forward and maybe we can have that discussion during um, executive session, but I don't, think there's anything that subjectively got pushed forward with a lower score at this well, time. I, I, it, there's a lot of, the, I, I couldn't tell you exactly for a couple of reasons. One is, in the, I, I wasn't aware at the time, the impression I had in November was that the property we talked about was not in consideration. But if it's in consideration, then you can forget about everything I said because it's still in consideration. I didn't, know, I didn't know it was in consideration. I, and, and maybe in, a, in executive session, we can talk specifics. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going right. to, uh, yep, go ahead, Laura. I'm sorry, I don't want to have a conversation. I just want to get something on the record. Um, Claire made a comment a few minutes ago about something, a property they were trying to buy, and then it just became unavailable. As a web member, um, that, that is where I feel um, very um, uh, in the dark when um, things happen and we're not, we can't talk about for whatever reason, or I don't know if we can talk about it at some point, um, but getting more information about what that means became unavailable. I, I, sorry, I think that we very talked bad. about that in executive session last month and it was very clear. Oh, all right. Well, I. Maybe I, I missed a point, so somebody will have to help me. Yeah, there, there might be some of this that, you know, just quite frankly, as the WAB, you know, like we only have one executive session per month. And, you know, we just have to trust the city as we do because they yeah. do good, good work. I'm yeah. not 
I'm not saying I don't trust the city. That is not my point. It's just feeling like I don't uh, having information. The inf if I don't have the information, then I feel like I can't be a good WAB member. So that's all. I don't want to have a long conversation about it. Well, it, it sounds like in an executive session, it'll be interesting to discuss specific properties and we can okay. drill down on specific. Sounds, sounds well, good. if I might, though, as an example, the property I was referring <laughs> to that you've been introduced to in the past, it was taken off the market. So that that was the end of that. Okay, great. I mean, that's that's all. That's I just was wanting the information. So in the next 47 seconds, we can discuss the uh, the progress report. Uh, I think it was a good discussion on the property acquisition document. Um, we did have on the agenda to discuss the progress report. Garrett, would you mind stopping your screen sharing? Oh, stopping? Unless we're going to look at it yet, continue to look at this. Yeah, well, I just was pulling up the agenda. I can stop share. Great, thank you. Um, so. Yeah, 47 seconds. I'd say uh, the document's really glitzy, fancy, and I can't compare it against the previous year. I'd have to pull up the other document to go look at it. I haven't done that yet. I'm thinking about doing that but it looks nice it's a it looks like progress was made but it, it, it's it's a uh, it's a summary document i'd have to wait and see what they say in the meeting for really understanding what changed and i'll tell you what i'm going to do i'm going to go right on to committee reports and sort of table the discussion of the progress report and if there's time at the end of the meeting we could bring it back up, but in keeping with the agenda, I feel like it's appropriate to say that we had a good good discussion of the property acquisition document and that was worthwhile. Let's 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 table the progress report discussion and see if there's time at the end. And uh, we could go in, we could maybe make up time perhaps. The next thing we had on the agenda at about 725 was the committee reports. And uh, I'm excited to announce that Abe did a great job reaching out to Gabe at the Whatcom Land Trust. Uh, and Abe, Gabe and I had a good conversation about what Abe has been talking about with, um, you know, some sort of donation mechanism. Uh, yeah in collaboration or consultation with the Whatcom Land Trust. Uh, we've talked about this before where perhaps a property comes up for sale and um, in certain circumstances, you can have like neighbors who would be very interested to know that a property is up for sale. And, you know, if, if, if something could be done to uh, encourage the sale to go towards the city and not towards a private developer, that could be of interest to surrounding landowners. So anyhow, uh, Abe uh, called a meeting and we had a discussion and it was it was very good. I'll let I'll let Abe describe a little bit more about that meeting. There was some discussion of um, uh, what's it called, property development rights, and that piece I didn't understand as much. So Abe could probably chime in on that. But Abe, if you want to describe a little bit of the discussion we had with Gabe at Wacom Land Trust, that would be awesome. Yeah, um, they were um, pretty willing to work with the city. Um, they Their membership has, um, he reiterated, this is something you told me about a year or two ago that the watershed is uh, one of their priority areas for the um, Wacom Land Trust membership, and um, and a couple things that seem really compatible um, that could make this work. Um, they're they're good at accepting charitable donations. They um, they allow people to um, earmark donations for certain things. So um, so if a neighbor only wanted to give money to uh, the purchase of a particular par per, um, parcel next to them, let's say um, that they have uh, the funding mechanisms already in place to earmark funds for that kind of thing, restricted funds, they call it. Um, they, 
have the potential of um, doing a public campaign of some sort, um, but that would be something that we would probably take a lot more uh, conversation um, with city staff about um, uh, as, as potentially as a means of um, recruiting um, donorship from um, people in the watershed. Um, they, I guess they recognize that sometimes the land trust is um, better positioned because they're not a public agency um, in negotiating with uh, landowners for property. And, um, but they're totally flexible as to, you know, who should take the lead in, in approaching um, uh, this sort of acquisition um, process. Um, so that they seem really interested and really flexible. Um, they don't really care who holds the property. Um, so like they'd be okay to holding an easement um, or um, holding the whole property. Um, they said there's probably some tax benefit um, to the city holding the property because I think the city properties are, don't have to pay property tax. Um, um, so anyway, that, that's kind of where they, they, they did talk about some other interesting things like um, this concept that I'd never heard about uh, called um, around trading uh, development rights. So if the city and the county, um, for example, wanted to um, set a quota of how many development rights could be developed or something like that, um, the watershed could be used as a development right bank. And so if, um, if, the, if we were trying to get more uh, funding for purchasing development rights in the watershed, if somebody wanted to, this is kind of a holistic approach. And so like there's a lot of demand for housing in the city, let's say. And so a developer is like, hey, I could, I could, um, I could, on this parcel that's only uh, platted for one unit or something like that, I could put in a high density here um, and I will pay to uh, purchase in order to get rights to have more density in this area, I'll fund the removal of density in another area like the watershed. So I thought that was a pretty um, interesting holistic approach that looks at um, development across uh, lands landscapes um, in an interesting way. But I don't know that we need to go there necessarily. I just thought it was encouraging that um, that uh, they're interested in um, keeping the conversation going and <clears throat> potentially the, the way I see this potentially working is that um, you know, Claire and Matt and Mike, um, you know, if they are interacting with people that want their neighboring parcels protected, they can potentially just refer to the land trust once we refer them to the land trust, once we um, kind of iron out some, some packaging details around how this might work. So that's all. I have, a, I have a couple of comments. Um, one is, and it sounds like maybe you didn't discuss this at length at least. Um, I'm interested in, I think it's on the city's, um, it's the city's responsibility to figure out how this might work. But mm -hmm. I'm interested in a situation where we have a, a piece of property that say is valued at a million dollars just because it's easy to say. and. Uh, it, our appraisal comes back at a million dollars and the property owner wants $1.3 million. And the neighbors can, if, and the neighbors are interested in um, participating in the, in the purchase and they can chip in $300,000. They can make up that difference. Can the city, I mean, like I said, this is on the city to figure out whether we can do this or not, but it, it's what appeals to me is can the city Come up with a process where we can where we can participate in a sale or in a purchase that 
um, somebody else chipping into. So essentially we're buying it for more than the appraised value, but we're not paying for more than the appraised value. And I'm, and um, I, I don't know if we committed to looking into that in the, in the past, but, or whether Matt had, I think Matt had said something about looking into it. Um, that intrigues me. I think that would be a, a really uh, interesting um, um, process to set in motion. The other thing is, if you want to know about transfer of development rights, let me know because I've been I've been um, considering and working with it for probably I don't know since I was on the planning commission in the county years ago. Hmm. Um, it uh, as far there is a program in place. We have sending and receiving areas, uh, receiving areas in the city. Uh, as far as I know, there's only been one um, transaction, and that was um, Ralph Black, I think it was, bought something like, um, I don't recall, I would just be making up numbers. He bought a, a number of development units out of the watershed and uh, put them someplace up on King Mountain or someplace. Um, the, the difficulty with the transfer of development rights is that um, the city's been reluctant to step in and start the market because then it's not a market, it's not market driven. It's, it's a government driven program. And that's, that's sort of antithetical to the transfer of development rights, development rights program. We have talked about kickstarting it by putting a couple, uh, some development amount of development rights in and, and setting a price. Um, because whenever we buy, purchase a property and I learned this the hard way, because at one point I, I negotiated away, I gave away some of our development rights that we were purchasing. And that was only a one-time thing and I haven't done that again. So we have a bank, we have essentially a, a lot of development rights that are um, available to a market, but they're just not selling. And then personally, if I might, I think because the city wants to densify the city, I think it's, um, I think it's reverse psychology or something to charge people to do what we want them to do. So if we want to densify the city and the way we go about that is to charge developers uh, a, a premium to create more density, it seems uh, backwards. And then the other fact is that we, we've been begging the developers, the development community to just meet the densities that are zoned in the city now. And that's just not happening. And um, I think it might be turning around. I don't have any present data, but I've been talking to the BIAWC quite a bit lately on another matter. And they are putting a lot of um, multifamily units into, the, into town. So that may be turning around. But anyway, it's a multifaceted issue. It's not real simple and there's quite a history with it, so. To the, Thanks for to, the information. First, to, to your first point and what Abe talked about with like neighbors chipping in cash, I just feel like that's a huge opportunity if we can yeah. figure that out. Um, I could be uh -huh. wrong, but I just feel like there could be a number of people where like through a combination of just a little bit of peer pressure and a little bit of money, you know, it's enough to tip the scales. Yeah, I have to uh, tell you that it's not all a sweet taste for me because um, Essentially, what we're doing is is developing a yeah a a watershed, a park for the people that can afford to live out there, including Abe and whoever else is out there. It's an interesting point. I, I, if I could chime in, I think it's a bigger opportunity to expand it beyond neighbors. I think there are people that will donate money for their legacy for the watershed. I personally would consider it. That's, that's and, a good thought. And I think, and if you come up, one thing I've learned, you come up with what you wanna do, I guarantee you, you can create a structure to do it. So if you need to joint venture funds and you know the city's limited by whatever the appraisal is, fine. You know, that that goes into the rules of the game, but it's it's, Creative things are done all the time, but what you have to do is come up with what you want to accomplish, put it in front of the right people, you know, lawyers for structure, maybe if the funding people. I still think there's room for these, um, uh, these donor advised funds all to chime into this. 
Hell, we could create our own fund. Uh, John, can you think of a sort of a specific example of a kind of a corollary of like what uh, what you've seen happen in the past, even if it's not related to you know homeowners, but I don't know businesses or whatever. And take uh, land trust. You can uh, you can donate money um, to the land trust, and it goes into a general fund. Could be for land acquisition. Right. You yeah. can do it to uh, you can do it to the hospital. Laura, yeah, I'm just curious. Something you said, Claire. Um, you were saying your your concern about this idea was creating this um, uh, park like atmosphere for the for the rich people. Did I understand that that was your concern? It's it's a niggling at the back of my mind. But yeah. I have experience with people that we've that we've purchased property next to that feel like it's their. Um, it's there for them. Okay. Yeah. They've I been just, very intolerant of any other users. Ah, okay. That's definitely, I can see that. Yeah, I was just trying to get a handle on that because, I mean, it, it strikes me that land in the watershed is already at a premium. And, it, you know, you have to be fairly wealthy today anyway to purchase, at least if you're near the lake. So, I, I thought I was missing something, but it sounds like based on what you just said, I, I think I get it now. I was just sharing personal feelings. I was emoting, you know, like I do so often, you know, I'm... <laughs> Good job. Uh, you know, I, I'd like a clarification on something. I, I'm not, I, I heard last week, I think not last week, our, our last meeting, I believe Renee said, uh, I don't want to put words in her mouth, but something akin to price is no object. The city is, is not constrained and the city can pay more than the appraised value. Yet during this conversation, it sounds like the, we're back to the appraised value is the most we can pay. Which is it? It is, it is not, there are exceptions. We can take um, particular projects to the council for approval for paying more than the appraised value but uh, reluctant to do that for several reasons. Uh, setting precedent is one of those. And um, so we've been very careful to keep the program uh, running on the appraised value uh, concept. Well, where, where did that come from? Where is, is, that, is that a regulation? Is that a co in the yes. code someplace? It is. It's in the program. I just want to add one, one thing that might be getting crossed into that, which is, you know, we have a bu our annual budget of 2.6 million, give or take, or whatever. And I think what Renee was alluding to is that, you know, we have a bu budget and then we have a fund. So we're not really going to, if we're looking at properties, we can spend past our budget. So you might have also been mixing those two together just a hair. Does that make sense? Like we're, there's enough money to go above our budget to continue to purchase property annually. Um, so that also may have been what you were thinking that we're not constrained by that two points. I, I just heard we're not constrained. <laughs> I, sure. the, the details were never stated. So uh, that's what I heard. I'm just, just wanted clarification on, on what, what the rules are really playing by. And then secondly, one of the things, and as, as I've mentioned before, I'm an advocate of, of purchasing, purchasing as much land as we can. And, and I don't really, and one of the reasons we said, well, we don't wanna, we don't wanna purchase land for more than the appraised value. And I think the reason we say is because it, will, it may cause a bidding war and the city, people are gonna know the city's gonna pay more. But it, it, with respect to what Abe's advocating and and or, or what you advocated, Claire, which, which is to have private citizens donate part of the money above that, above that appraised value amount. But aren't you effectively doing the same thing, bidding it up? You're just saying, I'm willing to pay the market value. You're effectively well, doing the same thing, whether the city does it or you do it in conjunction with neighbors. If we were able, if we were able to put that kind of a process in play, um, it would still be known that the city was only available, was only able to pay appraised value, was only willing to pay appraised value. There may be some circumstances where um, 
the people, the, whatever this, however this fund would be set up, whether it was neighbors or a more general fund, like what John is talking about, there may be situations where everybody would agree to purchase a piece of property um, uh, in excess of the appraised value, but the city would still have the um, reputation. It would still be viewed as uh, only purchasing property uh, according to their appraised value. It wouldn't, it wouldn't change the city's position. It, it may not, but the price of the of the of land continues to rise because people are paying paying more than the 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 appraised value. And the next time there's a purchase, that's the new standard. Well, that may be, but if if the if these fund holders, whoever they are, aren't willing to uh, chip in for that piece of property, then it doesn't matter. It, you know, it it wouldn't raise the the value. It wouldn't raise the price we're paying for property that it, it, it would because if, the, if there's if let's say the property is 1 million appraised and the owner wants 1.3 million and these other people are trying to raise that three 1.3 million then there's a, a, a likelihood that somebody's going to pay 1.3 million it may not be the city and the neighbors it may be someone else those those price the values here are continuing to rise there's yeah. nothing on the horizon that's saying they're going to go down everything actually, all indicators show it going up and actually what you're saying the truth of what you're saying ernie is that uh, appraised value is based on uh, property sales in the area so you're right in as much as if there were property sales in an area that were above appraised value or had had increased the price the, the price of properties <laughs> i don't know with that so if there's a property that is purchased for 1.3 the next time an appraisal is done yeah. that pro that 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 appraisal reflects in some way that 1.3 value so you're you're correct that over time it would uh, it would contribute to raising the property values in the, in the watershed well uh, so i'm gonna move on to the next agenda item uh, as always, good discussion on this. We'll continue to think about it and encourage people to communicate between meetings. We don't have to just talk about this during meetings, uh, but I often end up giving short shrift to some of the rest of the meeting. I wanted to uh, go to uh, staff reports. It's uh, 7.46 at 7.45. We were supposed to go to staff reports. Mike uh, had some follow-up that he sent in an email prior to the meeting and any other staff reports. Just wanted to give Mike an opportunity to, to um, do staff reports. Uh, and then we do still have some time for executive session after that. Uh, staff reports, city. Okay. Um, did you want me to talk about the Lake Wacom survey sure. first? Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, all right, I uh, just got a little blurb here first to kind of talk about the background of that survey. So the purpose of that, well, the what kind of the impetus for the survey was the new Lake Whatcom stormwater utility, um, which is to provide additional funding for county stormwater management programs in the Lake Whatcom watershed, such as capital improvement projects and enhanced education and outreach activities. So building upon a highly successful watershed watcher and adopt a block program in Birch Bay watershed, one of the outreach goals for 2021 was to evaluate if there is interest in stewardship volunteer opportunities in the Lake Wacom watershed, and if so, what type? Um, they will use the findings from the survey to guide development of volunteer programs and future outreach and engagement <laughs> opportunities in the watershed. Um, so if you guys want, I can share my screen and we can go through some of those answers or data, or if you'd like, you can just look at it on your own. But I know folks were interested in the survey results. You have that data. Um, I would. 
I think you emailed it to us. Can I recommend that we all kind of just look at that? I, I wish Anna was here. She was the one that chimed in a lot on right. survey stuff. Maybe yeah, I, right. I will, I'll take, I'll make a note to touch base with Anna on it. Cause I think it was her question. Like what, you know, what, yeah. what is the survey going to get used for? You just told us that. So we, we appreciate that. And we'll, we don't need to go through share screen of line by line results, but I would ask all the web members to take a look at what Mike emailed out. Thank you for looking that stuff up. Uh, and I will just briefly touch base with Anna because I think she'd be a good sort of point of contact on that. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, well, yeah, I mean, as far as staff reports from my end, um, I'm just continuing to work on prepping for the growing season, uh, which just is more maintenance on sites trying to stay ahead of things to make sure our restoration sites are successful. Um, and then we have a bunch of stuff in our contract office pending for to get work done this summer, um, just a couple different projects and uh, permits are in the works for those projects as well. They're just kind of different steps that get held up at different offices and um, things are moving forward as they do. And that's why I start early so we can make sure we get everything we need to get done during our work window in the summer. And um, other than that, uh, business as usual out there really. So Mike, um, uh, why do you, there's that one contract that might be of interest to, to the group. Um, sure, you want me to talk about the Galbraith? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, we went ahead and put together a request for a proposal, um, which is going to be a forest health initiative. Um, so we are going to try to get a silvicultural application uh, executed. I don't know. That's not really the right word. But um, yeah, we're just going to do some thinning at Galbraith. We've got 100 60 acres on that north side of the mountain and um, it's actually pretty it's a pretty mature commercial stand that is absolutely ready to be thinned um, this is something we've been looking at for about two years now and um, it's very, very healthy it's not too late it's not too early um, there's no disease at this point and so I've kind of just been watching timber values. And as you all probably know and have heard in the news or when you went to the lumber yard or heard someone complaining about it somewhere, um, prices are very high for any sort of um, lumber product. And so we're gonna go ahead and take advantage of that. And I would say timber prices are at the market value are up about for for our end about 50 percent from last year so it's just a huge increase in revenue for us instead of maybe breaking even or costing a little bit having done it last summer now we get to hopefully come out ahead and dump some money back into the program so we're working on putting that contract together to get out for um folks to bid on and uh, definitely looking forward to seeing how that progresses. Um, we're just working on the language with attorneys at this point and our contracting office and um, should be pretty neat. I think it's, I think it's worth um, highlighting that we've had this plan in place. We've had this intention at least in place for at least three or four years now where we decided to thin and, and Mike's right. We started seriously considering uh, how we would go about it a couple years ago. And uh, when, when we talk about making money off of it instead of losing money, uh, as you all know, that's not our, uh, making money off of our acquisition properties isn't our motivation. Uh, the forest health is our, is our motivation, but we also didn't want to lose money. And we didn't want to be paying for this if we could help it. And it looks like right at, at the timber prices now that we'll be able to at least break even or, or come out ahead on this, and and that's uh, 
a good use of public funds. So uh, we're excited to get this going this year. I guess uh, Olin physically raised his hand and then John it, may have yeah. virtually raised his hand. Uh, Mike, uh, thanks uh, for that. And I was just curious, because I ran into a document this week. Uh, uh, the document was written uh, June 2018 when Oregon State University called Competition and Density in Woodland Stands. And it, uh, <clears throat> it talks about density of forest and forest health, and it, and it uh, ranks uh, the density uh, for different types of tree forests and, and a lot of different parameters. And basically they, they can say, you know, at some point in time, you can't thin that forest anymore. It's just gotta be clear cut because it's unsafe to be in that forest and do anything. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know if this is a document that you have, I'm sure the concepts are what you're working with, um, but it's, it seems like a, when you look at this document and, and I, I did some tree measurements recently on a, in a, in a stand and I was like, oh, wow, this is right at the upper end where it looks beautiful, but really someone should be coming in here and taking some of these big trees or medium big trees down to open it up. And, and I was surprised by that finding. Yeah. Just curious if you've been working with that document or the well, concept. I don't, I don't think I've seen that one, Olin, but we're, we've been schooled by some foresters about the, the health of our stands. And this one, like Mike said, is really overstocked. Um, and what happened was we, we inherited by purchasing a commercial forest. And so um, they had logged it and then they'd come in and, and planted it. And then they haven't thinned it. They, they, there was no other uh, forest uh, um, activity to make sure it was a healthy forest. So um, that's what we're trying to catch up. We're playing catch up with this. Um, but if you if you we could send that uh, article to Mike and I, that would be yeah, I, I'd be glad to do that. And uh, and uh, oh, some years before I joined the board, I was working on a project uh, down in King County where we had a development project, and we wanted to retain as much of the forest as we could. But when we did, we had these two hundred foot tall trees with no girth in them and tiny little crowns. They all would topple over with any wind. It was just disaster, yeah. you know. And so uh, that you don't want to have that. Yeah. So does, uh, does the city of Bellingham have a forester? No, we have a consultant uh, and we've and we've consulted with DNR foresters on, on our projects and we've de de consulted with some private foresters also. Uh, who's the and, who's the and we have a forest management plan for this. Yeah, for this who's the consultant? AFM. Okay. Oh, on the, the for the consultant or the forest management plan? Uh, Clara mentioned the city has a consultant. I was just curious who or what it is. Um, well, we have a consultant, Kurt Feldheisen, who um, who um, cruises DNR timber um, uh, proposals for us and gives us reports on their environmental impact and, and how to improve them if necessary. I, I, lived, then, in, I lived in Tacoma for 15, 15 years in Pierce, uh, Pierce County or Tacoma Pierce, Tacoma, one of the parks departments has like, you know, an urban forester, but of course they're, that's a much bigger city. So I'm just curious if we had a similar thing or it sounds like you have a consultant, so. Yeah. Consultants are good. It's always good to hire consultants. I, I heard that Bellingham was maybe getting an urban forest or, or uh, I think a ar arborist or arborist. urban forestry, but that was more inside the city, not the, not Galbraith Mountain. Yeah, one of our one of oh, I'm sorry, one one of our managers is working on an urban forestry plan, um, yeah. and and you're right, um, it's Alan, it's it's um, focused on street trees, park trees, mm -hmm. yeah, things like that. But right. um, yeah. yeah, so it's a different kind of urban forestry. Well, yeah, it's not. We don't have forest blocks that we're that we're managing for forest um, service or for for timber or anything. At one time, John may have had his hand raised. I'm not really tech savvy. It looks like the hand is now down. But John, if you had something to say, now's your chance to chime yeah, in. I had it up earlier and uh, forgot to take it down. Thanks. Ah, uh, geez. Your, your, your virtual arm must be tired. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Oh, I'm sorry, was there any more city staff reports? No, I was going to just add one thing, um, just as far as some of the um, science that we use for prescriptions and 
like phosphorus and forest interactions. Um, there's just a ton of amazing research that has been done and sort of pumped out of the Cedar River watershed and the program that they have down there. So there's just like way more there's it it's like i feel like when i have a question like they have done a whole paper on it whenever it so there's and it's all online and public and so if you guys are ever really wanting to dive into different forest stands and the different phosphorus values of different species and canopy cover types and um, distribution it's all on their website and accessible and has been uh, super helpful i for one and more for you know more information is better so uh, anything you want to email to the web like no you know if yeah, they're sure. not interested in the details of phosphorus in this that or the other stand they can ignore it but i for one if you ever were to send out any sort of a link or whatever i would encourage you to do so well, if you don't know about the Cedar River watershed and how it's managed, that's a good, um, well, it's a depressing read um, <laughs> because it sets the, the bar so high, but um, it would, it's something I would aspire to if we were starting over, especially. That's an interesting statement. We're gonna Michael, are you going week. to send the URL out to the web? <laughs> yeah, I can do that. Great. Let's see, is it okay if we, uh, I'd oh, like to- I have two things. Yep, just go ahead. One is just to remind you all that the Joint Council's Commission's meeting is on um, March 31st, 6.30 to 8.30, I think maybe 8.30 to 9, or 6.30 to 9. Um, you'll hear from um, Angela Strecker, Dr. Angela Strecker, who has taken Robin Matthews' position up at Western. Uh, and so she'll be reporting out on the water quality um, uh, should be presenting on the water quality report from 2020. Um, and I, I was reviewing the slides today and it, it's, um, I think it'll be uh, informative. I think she put together a, a good, good show. And, um, and then we'll be talking about the, um, the 2020 um, um, uh, accomplishments report and some other things. Um, but anyway, good. It might be an entertaining evening. Well, only, only if you're water quality nerds, but it might be an entertaining meeting for this group. So um, that's one thing. The other, um, the other thing is I, I mentioned several months ago. I think now that uh, there was a company that was uh, wanted that was had a volunteered to characterize the um, the forest of our uh, watershed acquisition program. And uh, they, I think, um, well, according to the per person I, the, my contact, they were hit uh, like everybody else with the COVID slowdown issues. And so they're probably about six months behind, but they're uh, looking at starting up that study in June now. And it might still change, but um, I'm, in not, I'm not in a hurry and it's free. So um, whenever they get around to it, it's fine with me because I'm looking to get a, a pretty useful document, useful, um, um, yeah, product out of them. So stay tuned to that. And I think that's, um, I think that's all I have. Yeah, and I'll just uh, thank you. For, I'm glad you mentioned that. And I'm glad that uh, Ernie and others, I apologize if I'm not naming you by name, but many others have chimed in on the meeting next week. I'll just reiterate that Wednesday, six days from now, Wednesday next week, the 31st, would be the uh, the the meeting with uh, hearing from Western and the annual report and all that. And I think I would definitely encourage everybody to attend. So I will try to be there. There's some there's some reading materials that have been sent out. There's a bunch of links that have been sent. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you all there. Uh, let's see. Would it be okay to go to? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Ren, I I could be wrong here, but I feel like Renee joined us and I'm not going to put her on the spot now, but I'll say that Renee, in the beginning of the meeting, we kind of went around with um, a little reflection moment of like why we're all doing this or why we appreciate working in the watershed, et cetera, et cetera. And so what I was going to suggest is we go to executive session and after executive session, if you wanted to chime in on that, feel free to, but you know, no pressure. You can, you, anyone's welcome to take a pass. So 
Anyhow, um, we're two minutes ahead of schedule. Why don't we go to executive session? I Did I stop? Yep, you stopped sharing. Yeah. You okay. Good. Over. Thank you. Yeah, and the question uh, a question was raised about, you know, um, Matt is like kind of the guy. <laughs> He's just one one person dealing with all this. Uh, yeah. I mean, is there is there it, it maybe is worth discussion? Like, you know, is there some way to assist? Uh, yeah, he's just, he's one person with many, 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 many parcels out there. Well, I think what Laura's question was really is, is do we stand a chance of, of missing out on property because it depends on one person? That is my question. The answer not is probably It's really yeah. not about his workload per se, it's about losing the ability to purchase the land. Yeah, at some point you, you reach a, um, you reach a limit for what he can do, so. Okay, so, so, so yes. Okay, so can I, um, have you, Claire? Yeah. Have you seen an example in the last several years where that was an issue that we didn't, we lost our ability to buy a property because we didn't have enough staff time? No. You have not seen that happen? I don't, I don't recall of anything that, yeah, I don't recall. Okay, so my, my question is, Theoretical, your answer is yes, theoretically we could, but you haven't seen it happen yet. No. Okay. All right. I, I mean, it's just a, um, for me, it's a resource question. And given, you know, that we all agree that purchasing the land is, is really important for this long term health of the watershed, um, it, it's a question of, well, do we have enough resources and staff? And, and if we do, great. But I, I just want to make sure that that's that that that's on the table and that we're clear about that. The, my answer is probably nuanced, and I am just thinking about it as I'm as as you're talking. And um, it, you know, there are probably properties we haven't pursued for one reason or another, and I'd have to go back through and and think about whether that was because of resources or just because of their their um, condition. But um, I don't recall of anything that we, we've pursued several properties really hard that we haven't gotten. Um, and so I don't think that's been a limitation in the past. But, you know, we, but patience is also a factor in this whole process. Being able to wait for the property to come around, wait for the property owner to get comfortable with a with a um, appraisal or a, or a, a price um, taking it off the market and putting it back on the market there's all kinds of factors that that confuse uh, the that question or the answer to that question i mean is it we're running out of time here but i just have to ask is it what i feel like i've heard over and over and over is like the single biggest factor in not being able to buy a property is well, I'm sorry, the two single biggest factors mm -hmm. is uh, somebody not, quote, willing to talk to the city or what have you, and money, like this this price cap of, of appraised value. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, with that, uh, let us think about what we want to talk about. Uh, I encourage everyone to talk about stuff between meetings, not just during meetings. Uh, so plenty of plenty of possibilities to chat between meetings. But on the agenda for next month, I wouldn't mind re uh, reinstating the conversation about the 2020 annual report, uh, just to chat about it. I, I might ask that Rush you put on the agenda for next time, just to talk about that because we didn't have a chance um that sounds good think, yeah and then i think that let's put as a placeholder more discussion about this Wacom land trust thing that that abe has brought up because i think that's very promising let's at least put a placeholder on there to just you know continue that discussion if you wouldn't mind and what else, what am i missing for you know to do items for next agenda well, if, if, the, if the minutes of this meeting can remind me to um, 
ask around about a process that might be available to us to work with the land trust, um, that'd, that'd be helpful to me. Yeah, let's reflect that we wanna look into land trust slash city coordination on that issue. And I appreciate Aid for even thinking of that. Uh, and lastly, with one minute to go, I'm going to put Renee on the spot and ask her to chime in on what, what many of us chimed in on, which was like, what do we, what do we get out of this? What are we doing this for? What do we appreciate about uh, working on land, or sorry, working on protection of the, of the watershed, I guess. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, I'm not able to turn my video on because I'm on my phone. Um, I'm sorry, I missed the first half of the meeting. There was another meeting I had to attend and I really would have liked to have heard um, what you all said about um, the question as it's posed um, because I, I realized that you're all volunteers and you all spend a significant amount of time um, volunteering to help the lake and to help the city's um, programs as we all store the lake. And I think that's impressive. I'm always appreciative that people are willing to do that, um, to take time out of their busy, busy schedules. And Garrett, if I understand the question that you're asking is why, why do I participate in the WAB basically? Well, just like, uh, it was just a reflection on, you know, but is there something you appreciate about, you know, yeah, what do you get out of, or why do you like to, uh, or, what, or what have you enjoyed about this work? Uh, yeah, so I um, have spent my whole career working in public service. Um, I started off in a, in a more science role. Um, I've worked for the city in various capacities for 20 years. And when it's funny, when I came to the city, um, I was, I had just come back from my first stint in Antarctica and the Olympic pipeline, pipeline incident happened and I was in grad school and it all came together that I ended up being hired by the city, um, by Claire actually at the very back in the day. And uh, I had thought, well, I'm only going to be here for a few years and I'm going to do something better, more interesting. Um, and here it is 20 years later and I've never left. And I've never left because, not because I haven't looked, but because every time I look, there's no other jobs out there where I get to do this kind of work with these kind of people. Um, so I, I'm really passionate about improving the, the natural environment in Bellingham for the citizens of Bellingham. Um, I've mostly been involved in stream restoration up until I took this position about five years ago. And now I get to do all sorts of fun things like stormwater and climate change and lake walk and stuff. Um, so I, I continue to grow and learn and I really appreciate um, learning new things. And um, with Lake Whatcom specifically, you know, it's such a gem. And I think a lot of folks in Bellingham might take it for granted because it's always there and it's always in our backyard. Um, but I, from, I, from my travels around the world and other work that I've done when I went back to Antarctica the second time, I studied lakes down there. Um, and it's given me a perspective of how rare it is to have a lake like Lake Whatcom in your backyard and how rare it is to be able to take your drinking water from such a clean lake. Um, and I know we talk a lot about how the lake um, water quality is of a concern and we need to improve it. And, and that is true. But if you look at other jurisdictions out there and where they take their drinking water and the problems they have with their source water, we have such an amazing gem in Lake Whatcom. So that's, that's why I do what I do. Um, and I just wanna thank all of you for participating on the WAB because it does take your time and energy. I appreciate that. And we, I, I, I am certain I speak on behalf of all of the WAB that uh, we do appreciate uh, Rush, Claire, Renee, Mike, and the city staff's uh, hard work over the years, my, most of which exceeds my time on this issue <laughs> and your hard work on that. Did you say lakes in Antarctica? Because as a geologist, I feel really embarrassed to say this, but are, are there, did you say lakes in Antarctica? Yeah, there, there are. There are um, some of the only lakes in the world that never saw all the way through or freeze all the way. Okay. Uh, so there's know. liquid water underneath the ice. Did you swim? Did you, did you, yeah, okay. So if they don't freeze, or if they don't unfreeze, you didn't go swimming in any of them, I imagine. Not that I'm going to talk about here. <laughs> All right, well, only three minutes overdue. Appreciate everyone's uh, input this meeting and we'll take a look at the notes and have stuff for next meeting. And again, uh, I encourage anyone to communicate you know, between meetings on what, what we're working on. It's not you know, just these meetings, but we can be working on plenty 
plenty of stuff between meetings and I look forward to next meeting. Any, any final thoughts? Anybody, anybody? Going once, going twice? I have no jokes or funny comment. Oh, uh, uh, we're waving, okay. I have no jokes or funny commentary. So I'm just gonna say good night and happy spring. It is now spring. Thank God we got through the winter. <laughs> Bye. Bye.